Hey everyone, my name is Phil Blancardi. I'm the online campus pastor here at Church on Main. We are so grateful that you've joined us for the message today. If you'd like more information about our church or to connect with us or to partner with us through giving or to ask for prayer, please visit the link below. Before we begin, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us to gather online this morning. We pray that you would remove all distractions as we listen into what pastor has to say. Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, let us walk out of here uh, understanding what it is you have for us and how you've challenged us to go forward today, that we would apply those things and we would continue to honor you in the things that we do. In name we pray, amen. Mark chapter 11, verse 27, and we're gonna get to the end, Lord willing, today, verse 33, means we'll complete chapter 11. And so uh, if you found Mark 11, I'm gonna read verses uh, 27, uh, 28. I'll read a few verses. And then pray and we'll get into the message. All right. They came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and began saying to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do these things? And Jesus said to them, I'll ask you one question, and you answer me. Then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Answer me. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you and are so grateful that you've gathered us around this passage today. God, ultimately what we need is to hear from you. Ultimately what we need is to understand your word so that we can then apply it to our lives. And so God, Every one of us is bringing something into here with us. Every one of us is bringing some kind of frustration or fear, some kind of aggravation. God, every one of us is, well, we're all dealing with stuff. And so, God, you have our attention for a moment. And we're asking that while you have it, that you would speak to us from your word. That's what we need. And so, God, we will listen. And if you encourage us, if you confront us, Lord, if you make us laugh or make us nervous, Father, do whatever it is you have to do. Just don't leave us the same way we were when we walked through the door. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all can be seated. All right, so we're still in this, uh, what's called the Passion Week of Jesus, which is the week that's going to eventually lead to his crucifixion, a few days later, resurrection. What just took place was Jesus, the, the previous passage, what took place was Jesus uh, overturned. You remember he cleared the temple, walked into the court of Gentiles. He saw where they were selling animals and, and at an incredible markup. I shared that with you a couple weeks ago. They were doing the money changing. They were taking the currency of other countries and then ripping off the people who were coming there to worship to make a profit for themselves. And if you recall, the leadership of Israel were making tons of money by taking advantage financially of those who were coming to worship, by rip, <coughs> ripping off everyone who was coming to worship, and they were making so much money, they didn't even care if anybody was actually worshiping or not. Jesus sees it, gets so upset that he begins to like open the stalls of the animals that were there to be sold for uh, sacrifice, and he began to knock over the tables of the money changers and basically drive everyone out of the temple who were making such a mockery of the temple, and he just does it in such a way that there's this massive just chaos, like a circus with animals going around, people mad, people screaming, and he's in the middle of it all saying, this was supposed to be a house of prayer for everybody. You turn it into a robber's den. Now, you remember all that? That's what's leading into today's passage. So the next morning, he shows up in verse 27. They came again to Jerusalem. That's Jesus and his apostles. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. By saying the chief priests, scribes, and elders came to him, guys, that's everybody. Now, it doesn't mean every chief priest, every scribe, and every elder, but it means everyone's represented. The scribes are represented. The priests are represented. The elders are represented. We're talking about the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is the Supreme Court of Israel, the final decision makers of Israel. So they sent a delegation to confront Jesus. 
The high priest, the great high priest, would have sent this delegation on behalf of himself to confront Jesus. The Pharisees, scribes, elders, everybody, they sent a delegation to confront Jesus all because of what had happened. Now, here's who these people are. These are the representatives of the leadership of Israel. These are the representatives of the knowledge of the Old Testament. These are the representatives of the theology of all the understanding of who God is. They've got the theology, they've got the training, they've got the education, they just don't have the heart. Because it's possible to know a whole lot about God and still not know God. So verse 28 happens. They come to Jesus and began saying to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do these things? The things they're referring to are the clearing of the temple the day before. Jesus walks into this place. He doesn't have a title. He didn't have the education. He didn't have the training or the pedigree. And yet he walks in and does an official act removing them from the court And yet he does not even have an official title. He doesn't even have an official authority in their eyes. All that they know is this guy walks in like he owns the place and tells everybody to get out. Who does he think he is? And they're furious about it. So they're asking him, who gave you this authority? Who gave you the right to do this? Who said you could do these things? It's interesting to me that the question of the authority of Jesus reached the pinnacle of Jewish authority. I mean, the Sanhedrin is back in their private chambers and they're talking about the authority of this guy named Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, one person could have walked up to Jesus and said, hey man, we're all trying to figure this out. Who in the world do you think you are? But they send a delegation about it. Imagine if it's you and you're minding your business, and you walk into church one day, and there's a whole bunch of FBI and CIA agents, and they say, there you are, and they walk over to you surrounded, and they say, who do you think you are? Okay, you would feel like, why are y'all worried about me in Washington? Why are y'all gathered together as a group discussing this? You could have called. Like you're kind of wigging everybody out right now. This is a terrifying confrontation and everyone would have noticed. I mean, these people were dressed in a very noticeable way. They would have had headdress and robes and tassels and it would have flowed behind them. They drew attention. They drew a crowd wherever they went and they all come as this official delegation to confront Jesus. I'm telling you, everybody would have been watching. Jesus would already have had a crowd around him anyway. And they're asking about authority. Now that's interesting. Why would they be asking about authority? I'll tell you why. Because that's how the leaders of Israel thought. That's how they acted and that's how they spoke. Back then and even today, when a rabbi or a priest, one of the elders of Israel would speak, they wouldn't just talk, they would quote someone. And they would quote some famous, well-known, authoritative, respected leader of Israel. They would talk about Gamaliel. You know, Gamaliel once said, and then they would quote what Gamaliel said. Or maybe they'd quote Hillel. You know, Hillel once wrote, and then they would block quote Hillel from memory. Or maybe they'd even talk about this guy named Akaba. He was highly revered. You know what Akaba used to teach? Because I studied under Akaba, and they'd lay out all these teachings of Akaba. But they made sure to quote someone with authority over them. Interesting. Because people believe authority equals power. And what we believe is whoever has a whole lot of power, well, they must be right. If they're powerful, listen to what they say. If they're powerful, do what they say. If they're powerful, be in their corner, be seen as being on their team. Because if we can be associated with their power, maybe we'll get some of our own power. But what if someone shows up that suddenly has more power than you have? See, we love power, but we don't love it when somebody else has more power than us. So what happens if all of a sudden a person shows up with more power than you? Well, the way I see it, you have four options. You sort of wrote down some options as I understand them. One, option one, somebody has more power than you. Someone has more authority than you. You know what one option is? Remove the person. Now, this is what they were trying to do. 
Jesus seemed to have more authority. He seemed to have more power. The crowds were flocking to hear what he had to say, so they wanted him dead. Option one, remove the person. Another option could be, option two, remove their authority. This is what you see attorneys doing in a courtroom. An expert shows up, an expert witness that hurts their case, so then they go after and attack the expert. They're not really an expert. I have another expert that can counter whatever that expert says, so don't give them any authority. We're gonna just criticize them until now you have doubt. That's the second option. A third option is you could remove yourself from that person. Maybe you don't like the boss that you work for, so you just quit. Maybe you don't like the person that you're married to, so you just walk away. If you don't like their authority, remove yourself from the person. That's an option. Or there's a fourth option. The fourth option is the hardest. The fourth option is if someone else has authority over you, you could submit to their authority. That's the hard one, though, isn't it? See, we love authority when it's our authority. We hate authority when it's somebody else's over us. We like telling people what to do. We don't like being told what to do. And we'll begin to quote our own ability. I should have the right to say these things. I should have the right to do these things. I should have the right to do whatever I want. In fact, I'm of a certain age. I'm of a certain ability. I've got certain money. And in reality, let's say that you're single, you're not married, you live by yourself, you have a great job. You know what that means? You can do whatever you want with your money, right? You earned it, you've got it, it's your house, it's your money. You can go to bed when you want, you can get up when you want. You can go on vacation where you want, you can come home when you want. You can watch on TV what you want or pick whatever dinner and restaurant you want. It's your money, you're by yourself, you've got all the authority. But what happens if suddenly you lose that authority? That's hard. So you've got four options. Remove the person, remove their authority, remove yourself from that person, or submit to it. These rabbis loved quoting other rabbis because that showed their authority. If I can quote Gamaliel, if I can quote Hillel, if I can quote Aqaba, if I can quote any of these incredible great leaders before me who had authority, you're going to start giving me authority. Plus, it will show you how smart I am that from memory I can block quote these people. Did you ever notice something about Jesus when he taught? He never quoted another person, did he? Jesus never said, you know what Gamaliel said once, because that would then mean Gamaliel's got authority over him. He never quoted Hillel. He never quoted Aqaba. You know who Jesus quoted? Jesus quoted the word of God. That's who he quoted. And over 70 times in the New Testament, we see Jesus saying something like, truly, I say to you. Truly, truly, I say to you. You've heard that it was said by them, but I say to you, and he would give another teaching. He didn't quote somebody else. And you want to know why? Because he himself had and was the authority. In fact, when we look at some of the statements about Jesus in the New Testament related to authority, we see statements like this. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. How much authority? All of authority. Which authority? Every bit of it. And who has it? He's got it. How did he receive it? Because it was given to him. Who does that mean gave it to him? God the Father. And not only does it say that there, Paul wrote about him in Philippians chapter two, verse nine, God highly exalted him, that's Jesus, and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. Why would you quote somebody else's name when your name is higher? And as if that wasn't enough, he even told the church in Colossae, he, Jesus, is the head over all rule and authority. And you know what's interesting is the time that the apostles finally began to see the kind of authority that Jesus actually had was this one particular event that blew their mind. They're out on a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and a storm blows up. The storm was so extreme, so sudden, so terrifying, they all were convinced they were about to die. One of them even goes over to Jesus and kind of scolds him. How could you be sleeping when we're all about to die? Do you not care? And you remember what Jesus did? He gets up and almost as calmly as he says, he says to the storm, hey, knock it off, right? 
Peace. Be still. The apostles were suddenly, it says, terrified, and they asked this question. Who is then, who is then is this, go with me on that, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This guy has so much authority that even the storm does what he says. Why does Jesus have so much authority? It's because Jesus is God, and it terrified them. It terrified them then, and it still terrifies them today. The interesting thing about that word authority, in fact, I'll show it to you. By what authority do you do these things? Now, we just use the word authority, but I want to show you what this is. It's a Greek word. <clears throat> it's exousia. Exousia means so much more than just authority. In that language, exousia means you have authority, so you can make decisions. Also can be translated power. You see it translated power sometimes. Sometimes it's even translated the right and freedom to do. Freedom to do. And that's an interesting translation of it. It's an interesting meaning of it. We just use the word authority. So Jesus is able to come in there because he has this unparalleled exousia. He has this unparalleled power, unparalleled knowledge, unparalleled understanding of God and his word, unparalleled freedom to do. All of those things terrified the leadership of Israel. Not only did he have authority, power, and freedom to do, he even has knowledge. See, he understood what question they were actually asking. He understood what they were really trying to do. Now, they asked the question, by whose authority did you do this? Who gave you authority to do these things? But he also understands it was a trap. So Jesus understanding the trap, and here's what the trap was. The trap was it wasn't a real question. The trap was it wasn't a sincere question. I mean, these guys show up and, and they start asking this question of him. Let me pull it back up. Let's see. There we are. <clears throat> they start asking this question. By whose authority are you doing these things? Jesus gives an answer, though, that's fascinating. It says in verse 29, Jesus said to them, I'll ask you one question and you answer me. And then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Who was the, bab or was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Answer me. Now, that's a fascinating way to respond because he knew it wasn't a real question. He knew it was just a trap. What they were trying to get Jesus to do was to say, God, God gave me this authority. That's what they were trying to do. And if you say the word God in the Old Testament days, oh, that was forbidden. That'd be considered blasphemy. If you said Yahweh, if you were seen as blaspheming God, capital punishment. They could stone you right then if they wanted to. And they would say, this man has blasphemed. They were trying to get him to blaspheme. Who gave you this authority? So that's why he says, let me ask you a question. John the Baptist, when he was baptizing, was his authority from heaven? Notice he didn't say God. He knew what they were up to. He says from heaven, represented God without saying God. Or was it from men? Fascinating question, and here's why. The delegation shows up, they've got Jesus cornered. And here's all their group of Pharisees, scribes, elders, priests. I mean, this is the who's who. I mean, these men are the elders of Israel. These men are the leaders of Israel. These are the court holders of Israel. They walk up to Jesus, who gives you this authority? It's a sarcastic, smart aleck trap, and they, they were pretty smart in actually doing it. So they're looking at each other, and here's Jesus, and they're like, who gave you this authority? Gamaliel. Did you give him this authority? You didn't give him that authority? Uh-huh. Jesus, Gamaliel didn't give you this authority. Hillel. Where's Hillel at? Hillel. Did you give him this authority? Oh, you didn't. Huh. Jesus, Hillel said he didn't give his authority. Where are some of the temple priests? Temple priests. Did any of you give him the right to do this? You didn't? Huh. Well, Jesus, it's interesting. We're looking left. Nobody's given you any authority. We're looking right. Nobody's given you authority. Left, right. We don't see anybody here that's given you this authority. Jesus says, see, that's your problem. You know how to look left and right, but you have forgotten how to look up. And you no longer consider God in your decision making. What Jesus was showing them is they knew how to have theology, 
but they had gotten to a point where they thought the way to live life is just to see what you can get away with. Authority doesn't matter. Leadership doesn't matter. Rules, right and wrong. Pff, no. no, the way you live is just see what you can get away with. They knew the rules. They even knew who had the authority. In fact, one of the great theologians of history, John Calvin, says about this comment, the reason Jesus didn't give them an answer was not because he was being coy, but because they asked the most obvious question they'd asked to date. Who gave you this authority? They knew full well. They knew full well. I mean, Jesus is walking in there saying, who gave me this authority? Oh, let's see. See, I walked on the water once. I've got authority over physics. I told the storm to calm. I've got authority over the weather. I once told a man who was blind to see. I've got authority over eyeballs. I've got authority over ears. I've got authority over humans. See, all authority has been given to me over heaven and earth. I've got so much authority, I command even the demons, and they do what I say. I sent them into a whole herd of pigs. Which of you have done that? What authority do I have? You know full well what authority I have. I've got authority over life and death. I speak to a tomb and the dead walk out. What authority do I have? You already know. You just don't like the answer. And so you're going with option one. Get rid of the person. You're just trying to get me killed. So they lay this trap. Jesus is so much smarter than them, though. You know what happened? They laid a trap, and then they stepped in it. He says, let me ask you a question. The baptism of John the Baptist, was it from heaven or was it from men? And they just cringe. Because verse 31 happens. They began reasoning among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he'll say, then why do you not believe him? Yep, they're right. And that was the way that Jesus responded to their trap. You see, Jesus understood that the entire community knew and believed the message of John the Baptist. And what was the message of John the Baptist? I'll show you. In the Gospel of John, different John, chapter 1, verse 29, talking about John the Baptist, it says this of him. The next day, he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not only that, but even a little bit later in chapter 1, verse 34, John the Baptist said, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. And as if that wasn't enough, even in the Gospel of Mark, in Mark chapter 1, verse 8, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Nobody else can do that. There's no other man alive that can command the Spirit of God. There's no other man alive that can baptize anybody with the Holy Spirit of God. There's no one that can do that. But he says, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And if John was a prophet, a real prophet, a true prophet, then what he said is right. And so if they go about saying, nah, he wasn't really a prophet, we can discount and doubt and deny everything that John the Baptist said, well, then what do they become guilty of? Blasphemy. So they continue their debate with each other, They're trying to find a way to just avoid the obvious truth. Because that's what people do. We see what God's word says, and it irritates us so much because it's got authority. So we can't remove the authority. We can't remove the person. We can't remove ourselves. So what do we do? We argue, we debate, we look for loopholes. People come to me and they say, okay, Pastor Brian, I see this passage here in the Old Testament and I'm just struggling with it. Does the Hebrew give any indication that maybe there's a better way or a different way to understand this? Brian, I'm seeing in the New Testament here, does the Greek translate it differently? Because I don't like what it says and I don't want to change my lifestyle. So is there a, a change in the Greek? Is the English somehow flawed? And it's like, yeah, here's the problem. When I go showing you the Greek, it makes it worse on you, you know? I mean, the original language is like so much more obvious even. 
And so what do they start saying at that point? Verse 32, we're talking about John the Baptist. Shall we say his baptism is from men? They were afraid of the people for everyone considered John to have been a real prophet. I love how that verse is even written there. So they're debating. You can almost hear them. They're like, look, if we say it's from heaven, then he's going to say, why don't you believe him? Because he said, I'm from heaven and that God sent me. But look at how that ends. But if we say from men, and it just kind of like abruptly stops. It's like this, like these, you know, dot, dot, dot. It's like they're going, look, if we say he's from God, then he's got us, he's got us cornered. But if we say John the Baptist is just another man, whoo. Like they know exactly what that means. Because all the crowd in the temple are leaned in going, this ought to be good. On, in one corner, we've got Jesus. Jesus walks on water, heals the people, calls people from the grave. I mean, Jesus is Jesus here. He's been feeding people from nothing. And in the other corner, we've got the leadership of, of Israel. He, they laid a trap. He turned it back on them. That's what he did. They lay a trap against Jesus and he picks up a mirror. It's like the ultimate shield. And then their accusation becomes a trap for themselves. And now they're going, okay, what do we say here? And these people are leaning in because they're like, okay, we believe clearly and everyone else did as well that when Jesus was out there preaching, when Jesus was out there teaching, when Jesus was out there baptizing, he is a real and true prophet sent by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you're getting ready to say that he was not a God, if you're getting ready to reject the teaching of a prophet of God, we're gonna stone you all. So they're right. The Sanhedrin knew what would happen. And however they answer, they're stuck. And you're like, well, why didn't they just say it? Why didn't they say John the Baptist was a prophet sent by God? Well, because that's the end of them. It's the end of their way of life. Because then that's them confessing, you don't need them anymore. Wait a minute. Jesus is the Messiah? Oh, <laughs> you don't need rabbis anymore. In fact, we're going to sit and listen to him teach. You don't need priests anymore. He's the priest. We're coming to him, our real and true great high priest. We don't need to make money off the sacrifices anymore. He will be the sacrifice of all sacrifices. You don't need scribes. You don't need Pharisees. In fact, all of us are completely unneeded. There will soon be a priesthood of believers. Jesus is who he says he is. He is who is prophesied to be. And we're going to lose all of our fame, all of our income, all of our... I mean, they wanted the great seats at the banquet tables, didn't they? They wanted the position of, prov of, of, uh, of, of, of prominence. They wanted to be able to be the ones that were pointed to. They wanted to walk down the, the aisle, which is what would happen. They'd walk down the pathway in the marketplace and the crowds would part and like bow when they went by. They'd point to their kids. That's who you want to be like. That's why they wore these big, elegant, flamboyant outfits with tails and tassels that just dragged behind them to get all the attention in the world. They loved that stuff. That's why they were experts in theology, but they had no heart for God. And if you think, okay, well, Brian, are you being too harsh? No, this is what Jesus said. I mean, how did he refer to them? Whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but you're dead inside. Brood of vipers. Don't get too close. You're going to get bit. I mean, he had no patience for the mockery they had made of the real and true God of Israel. Everyone saw Jesus, uh, John as a, as a prophet. And so for them to, to not just say the obvious truth, you know what Mark is showing? He's showing that they, they've rejected Jesus, but they had long ago already rejected John the Baptist too. I mean, he's out there preaching repentance and baptizing a baptism of repentance. Did you ever notice the Sanhedrin show up to get baptized? No. No, they're not going to repent. Because then they'd have to be humble. They'd have to admit they've done something wrong. And that wounds the ego, doesn't it? I mean, that's why Jesus was... That's why Jesus said what he said in Matthew 23 verse 37 he wept for the people of Israel he said Jerusalem Jerusalem who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her just like heaven represents God 
Jerusalem was representing the people of Israel. And he's like, this is what you do. Every time truth shows up, you know what you do? You kill the prophet. And why do people do that? Well, because it's so much easier to kill the prophet than it is to kill your own sin. It's so much easier to try to slander the prophet than to say, no, he's right. It's so much easier to silence the prophet. So how do you and I do that? The same way they did. You may not pick up a stone and stone the person who brings the truth, but what do you do? You walk away, you look for a loophole, you ignore it, you figure out a way to just get away with what you know you should not be doing. It's like, yeah, I know what God says. I don't care, but I know it. My theology's fine, but I don't really have a heart for God. And that's what people do. I mean, at the very least, what we do is we silence the prophet and we just, we just close the word and walk away from it. Because if we don't read it, what, does it not have authority over your life? It's so much easier to kill the prophet than it is to kill your sin. It's easier to ignore God's word than it is to follow it, isn't it? So this trap that they laid for Jesus, now that they've stepped in it and they've got to give an answer, here's their answer in verse 33. Answering Jesus, they said, we don't know. And Jesus said to them, nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. It's interesting. They got one thing right. A decision about John the Baptist was a decision about Jesus. And they knew that if we confess and if we're honest and if we say the truth, then we have to change the way we're living. That's ultimately it. And so Jesus gives an interesting answer. Well, then nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, yes, yeah, what I thought. This wasn't a sincere question. It wasn't. It was just a charade. This is a game to you. I mean, they thought they, thought they could catch Jesus because he would be more interested in his fame than he, than he was about the truth. They didn't realize he was there to lay down his life for the truth. They weren't, but he was. He was willing to die for the truth. They were only willing to kill in order to hide the truth. You know, they're asking them, they're asking Jesus about who gave you this authority. Mark gives us this passage because he shows them that Jesus is now asking them, what authority do they live under? And the implication for you and me is the same question. Whose authority do you live under? Because if it's not God's, then whose is it? For them, they lived under their own authority. They wanted to satisfy their own flesh. They wanted to do whatever they desired. The obvious truth here is that Jesus was sent by God. His arrival was prophesied in God's word. And his authority would then outrank all of theirs. I mean, Mark included this. Mark wrote this. Peter preached this. Because it, comes to, it becomes the question that each of us have to answer. You, you see that God's word says you're supposed to worship him. But what do people say? Yeah, yeah, I know it. I know God's word says worship him, but I'm just not really into that. Yeah, I know God's word says to obey him, but, well, I've got different beliefs than that. Yeah, I know God's word says to believe in Jesus, but I just want to go have my fun first. I mean, is this not the same thing that's been said for thousands of years by the ignorant, by the foolish? I mean, people who are not able to be honest with themselves will never be honest about Jesus. It's not just the Pharisees, but... A lot of people go to Jesus, not to follow him, but to argue against him. I mean, these people got to a point with Jesus that his response to them was just judgment. Jesus is like, okay, fine, live your way. Ignore me, ignore God's word. Yeah, you have that choice. But one day you're going to regret it. And you'll regret it for all of eternity and it'll be too late. 
And you'll be asking things like, why didn't I just listen? Why didn't I just submit? Why did I have such a rebellious heart? Why did I not just do what I knew was the right thing to do? Why did I keep trying to see how much more I could get away with? Why was I so blasphemous to God, if not with my mouth and certainly with my body and with my actions? I mean, we look at the Pharisees and we say, ah, I can't believe them. We need to look at ourselves and say, in what way am I being a Pharisee? In what way do I see the plain truth right in front of me? But I say, no, I'd rather live a different way. In what way do we see the truth and say, there's got to be a loophole? In what way do we hear the truth and say, kill the prophet, close the Bible? Maybe you, you even say to yourself, and I hear this sometimes, like, Brian, what gives you the right to say that? Who made you the authority And my answer is simple. It's not my truth. It's not even my opinion. It's what God says. So I don't get up here and say, truly, I say to you. Truly, truly, I say to you. You've heard that it was said, follow your heart, but I say to you. You've never heard me say that. Instead, what you hear me say is, truly, God says to you. Truly, truly, God's word is clear. You've heard that it was said, trust your heart. God has said, don't do it. So for you today, the truth, it's the same truth. You've got to decide whose authority you're going to follow. And any answer other than following God is ignorant, stubborn, prideful, and eternally deadly. So ask yourself, What is the thing in your heart right now that you're listening to and that you know this is not pleasing to God and I have tried to get away with it? Well, that's the thing God is saying right now. Man, repent. Repent. Confess it to God. Say, God, I am so sorry. Please forgive me and help me to turn away from it. You know what repentance is? I mean, the Greek is this word that means to change your mind. It really means to turn. And people never talk about what you're turning from or to. When you're repenting in God's word, you know what it means? It means you're turning away from the demonic temptation that has captivated your heart. And you're turning towards the God of the universe who offers freedom. But the freedom just seems so mysterious. The freedom seems so hidden and secretive. Because you can see the benefit of the temptation right in front of you. But what God offers seems to be so far away and distant, it must not be true. So don't just change your mind. When you're repenting, you are saying, I'm changing my eternity. I don't want to burn in hell because temptation was so much greater to me than following what God has said. Anyone that you follow other than God's word is eternally deadly. Okay? You pray with me? Father, we love you, and we know we are guilty. We know Jesus has all the authority. God, forgive us for having a smile on our face when we say that. God, the greatest truth is that Jesus has all the authority because he loves us. He leads us. He laid down his life for us. And if we come to him, he forgives us. If we follow him, he frees us. Church, your head It's bowed, your eyes are closed, and whatever is in front of your mind right now, the thing that you need to ask God to forgive you from, then I need you just need to do that. Do that right now. And just say, God, I'm sorry. I mean, He wants to forgive you, you just have to ask for it. Maybe in this moment you're identifying a particular weakness. And you need God to make you strong, disciplined. This is your opportunity. I mean, they're going to lead us in one last song. And you have this opportunity just to respond.
you can respond. Don't, don't just do nothing. In the time that we come in here, it's an investment into your eternity. It's training for how to live. It's not a history lesson. It's a God and you lesson. And he has your attention. So respond to him. In a moment when I say amen, the altar will be open. There will be people down here you can talk to. You can come up and just pray if you want. It doesn't matter. Or even where you are, you can do that there. So I encourage you to do that. Father, we ask that as we respond to the truth of your word, that you would strengthen us because it's in that way that you conform us to the image of your son. That's our desire. That's your desire. So have your way with us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Brian has given us some great takeaways. Be sure to take some time to reflect on all the things we've learned and how we can apply those teachings to our lives. If by chance you prayed that prayer during the invitation for the first time, we want to congratulate you and welcome you to God's family. That's a really big deal to us and we want to celebrate by connecting with you. Let us know you made that decision by clicking on the I Made a Decision link in the chat and we'll be able to connect with you on a personal level and walk you through our next steps. We want to thank you for being with us. We love you and we look forward to seeing you next week.